A lot of people struggle to raise private money, but what if you were able to easily network at a pool party and raise hundreds of thousands of dollars in private money without asking anybody for money? Well, that's exactly what my guest did, and he's raised millions in private money. Today, I'll be talking with my friend and fellow Mastermind member and superstar NFL football player, Dean Rogers, who has left the NFL and turned real estate investor, and he's raised millions in private money. And Dean's going to share in this episode how private money has completely transformed his real estate investing business. Now, if you're looking for private money, you don't want to miss a second of this episode. Let's dive in right now. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Well, can you believe my guest today started his career in the NFL, my lands, with the San Diego Chargers? Now, it wasn't long of him being in the NFL. He soon realized that if he kept playing in that National Football League, his health just might be at risk a little bit. So anyway, he walked away from the NFL, and he's been in the real estate investing industry all the way since the same year that I started, which was 2013. And um, anyway, he has just built a wildly successful business out there in California. Well, since he started, he's flipped, he's wholesaled hundreds and hundreds of houses, and he's got a rental portfolio of eight figures a year. Well, he's passionate about real estate, and he's passionate about helping others how to learn and build uh, wealth, build freedom. That's what it's all about. So in uh, 2022, my friend and guest created what is called the Wholesaling Playbook. And that's put together to provide a resource for people like you that want to take their real estate investing business to the next level. And this playbook shows step-by-step -step how easy it is to use his proven systems and best practices that he's using right now to create an active seven-figure business right now in today's market. And with that, I'm so excited to have my friend, my fellow mastermind member, Dean Rogers. Welcome to the show, Dean. Jay, thanks for having me. Man, after that intro, I don't know how I'm going to live up to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you ate your Wheaties this morning as though yeah. you were still in the NFL. And uh, so anyway, we're going to have a great time. So I know that you have, um, you've been in business for a long time. And I know from our previous visits, you've raised a lot of private money. Uh, right. in your career. I want to talk about private money. And I want to uh, also talk with you about your wholesaling business. Because, yeah. you know, that's pretty cool. You raise a lot of private money, but you're also a wholesaler. I'm going to want to hear how you determine what's the difference between or what's the criteria of staying in a deal or not staying in a deal and just sort of wholesaling it out. But let's go ahead and dive in right now with this first question. And that is, what was it that was going on in your real estate investing career that caused you to start raising private money? Well, I love that question. Private money is essential if you're wanting to grow your business and you're an active investor in the fix and flip and the rental game. Um, for me, I realized when I first got started, wholesaling was the thing that was going to get me in the game and get me making money. And then after that, I found my business partner. He said, hey, you want to start doing flips together? Now, at the time, I didn't have the resources to flip these properties. And he said, he'll go ahead and help me out there. But soon after, one of my marketing pieces that went out, a seller called me and said, hey, I don't want to sell my house, but I got three million bucks in the bank. What kind of return could you give me? And that's all it took for me to set up a meeting, get in person, and he even asked if he could bring one of his friends who had even more money, quote, end quote. And I said, please bring that person. We'd love to meet both of you. And so that's where the private money fix and flip buying rental journey began. 
And my eyes suddenly opened because I came from not this world. I didn't understand really investing. I didn't understand how you could use other people's money. It was more so introduced to me as an idea. And the light bulb went off. Holy smokes. Instead of buying one property at a time with a partner who had some, some capital, some resources, I can buy almost unlimited properties. It's as good as many good deals as I can find, I can buy because now I presumably have endless resources for the market that I'm in. So Jay, that was all it took for me to understand private money was the game. And so from that private lender and his friend, we flipped hundreds of houses within uh, a handful of years there just from those two people alone. What's your definition of uh, private money or a private lender, uh, say, in contrast to a bank? Yeah, so a bank, you're, you're going through a long process of getting qualified, and they're very rigid on their terms. You kind of have to abide by their rules and their guidelines and their process, and you're kind of at the mercy of how fast they can move. You're at the mercy of uh, the resources you probably need to bring to the table to put that deal together. Whereas with a private lender, you can pretty much write your own terms and make up whatever you want. Now, granted, you can't, uh, for instance, pay them a thousand percent interest because you know there's some rules around how much interest can be uh, can be paid and earned on a, a certain transaction. But with the these private lenders, you can borrow the full amount of the purchase price plus extra. I mean, instead of being limited with a bank of, hey, you need to come in with 20% down or 10% down. And, uh, you know, this is our process. You can, just like I did, I told you uh, as we were talking last week, we just closed on a deal. We closed in 24 hours. The, the prelim was clear. Title was clear. Uh, all we needed was to get the seller to sign, which they did the very next morning. We closed in 24 hours with a private lender who I called the day we opened escrow and said I needed to borrow $30,000 in excess of the purchase price. He was more than happy to do it because we had the deal at a discount and he wired money the, the day we closed escrow and we got it done. And that's a great investment return for them. They have their money secured against a physical, tangible asset, which is real estate secured just like the banks would getting, in this case a 10% annualized interest return. And that's way better than less than 1% sitting in the bank. There's a lot of people out there with money sitting in the bank that is getting them nothing, just collecting dust and getting destroyed by inflation. And they're just finding, just wanting to find a way, begging a way to invest their money passively in a safe investment vehicle with somebody they can trust. So there's, there's just so many resources out there when it comes to private money. So when you're talking private money, are you talking private? I mean, are you talking hard money or is there a difference? There's a difference, right? So with hard money, it's an institution, an actual company that got you know certified or whatever the process to be able to borrow other people's money and, and essentially pool it, keep it within their own uh, fund and then lend it out. Uh, usually at a higher interest rate, and then they had you know charge administrative fees and points and such. So a hard money lender is someone you can pretty much count on to have money available because they've borrowed private money from other people. Now the thing is with hard money, they still have more of a process. It is a little bit more rigid, but granted, hard money is great. I've still used hard money because they are in existence with the sole purpose of providing investment capital for people like you and me who are looking to buy investment property. So hard money lenders are great. However, they're not quite as flexible as a private lender is. Like I said, we closed escrow in 24 hours. All that this gentleman had to do was sign, uh, hand sign, and we scanned and sent to escrow his approval of the terms. And then he showed up to the bank and wired his money. That was all that took place on his behalf. And for us, all I did was sign the closing documents and get those to escrow. So there's where the flex, ultimate flexibility comes in with private money because you're establishing how much money is being borrowed, at what interest rate. It could be 1%. I mean, shoot, it could be even 0% uh, if they just felt so uh, 
so um, generous to just let you borrow money for free. But typically, you might find a private lender lending anywhere from six to ten percent. I mean, it, it can be as broad as that, but nonetheless, it's more flexible than hard money. And typically, it's from just people in your sphere of influence or someone you've met at an event. And uh, it's an individual; it's person to person. Whereas the hard money lender is an institution; it's a company that you would be interacting with. So you just mentioned uh, one reason you like private money over hard money is that you can close quickly. You closed close quickly. Uh, and you closed in 24 uh, hours with that private lender. <clears throat> uh, you also uh, mentioned a moment ago that uh, the interest rate, uh, you set it uh, and where you set the interest rate, your private lender is yeah. not setting it. Um, what are some other reasons that you like private money over hard money? Uh, again, it's just that relationship that you build. Hard money lenders, great. Again, you can establish a relationship, but those people might turn over. They might turn over and they've got someone else, you know, kind of be in the sales role. With private money, um, just this past weekend, Jay, is a perfect example. I'm at a pool party with my kids, just uh, chit-chatting with uh, some of the folks there. The guy just said he's selling his house. He's going to have about a million dollars liquid. He doesn't know what to do with. And there I am talking about real estate. He's like, well, you're in real estate, aren't you? I sure am. Well, yeah. What kind of deals are you doing, Dean? Well, um, you know, I'm buying this flip over here and I'm, I'm buying this rental and escrow right here. And we borrowed this amount of money from this person. And I just subtly mentioned the fact that we borrowed money and instantly his, his uh, ears perked up and said, well, I'd love to do, you know, an investment like that because <laughs> I can be hands off and um, I don't know what I'm going to do with this money. So, you know, keep me, keep me posted take my number. So for me, it's, it's the relationship that you build. And ultimately it's the flexibility because now you can start to structure these deals that are, are more advantageous for your business and, and help you with your cash flow. Cause if you, if you're bringing your resources to the table to buy these deals, then you're still in the same position where you only have so many deals you can do because you're limited to the resources you currently have. Um, not to mention the overhead that you're going to have and marketing expenses. So for me, <clears throat> it's that ultimate freedom and flexibility to be able to grow your business. Now, in addition to um, meeting someone and chit-chatting with someone at the swimming pool over the weekend, where else do you find private lenders other than at the swimming pool? Yeah. So uh, the easy, easy, easy place to do it is at a real estate investing meetup, right? Um, for me, that's always been good because everyone's there intentionally to learn and build relationships. And so if you're now, just like I did at the pool party, explaining what I'm doing and sharing the fact that I'm buying property, using other people's money and giving them a you know 8 to 10% annualized interest return, if they're actively interested in that line of business and they get a good um, feeling from you and, and you've demonstrated that you have experience, they're going to want to work with you, right? And so um, the real estate meetups have been great. And now, nowadays, Facebook. I mean, think about all the Facebook friends you got that are watching what you're doing. So if you're posting about how you're actively marketing, you're actively buying deals, um, people are going to take notice and they're going to see what you're doing. And then all of a sudden you might say, Hey, I just bought a deal looking to establish a relationship with some new private lenders. Um, and for friends reach out to me and we can chat about it. And you bet you better believe if people are paying attention and noticing what you're doing, they're going to, they're going to want to be a part of your journey too. Right. And so, um, that's naturally a good place to do it. And then the ultimate creme de la creme, which, uh, you've spotlighted to me. It's something funny enough, Jay, I haven't, I haven't really had to focus or put my effort there yet. Um, because we've scaled down our flips to be doing more wholesales and buying more rentals and, and not doing as many, um, flips at a time. Um, one of the great places to go is the, um, well, you, you might know how to say it better than I do, but uh, the the events where they have the retirement accounts, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Self-directed IRA yeah. events. Self-directed IRA events. And I've worked with several, Jay, myself, 
uh, you know, private lenders who just so happen to have self-directed IRA accounts. And what do you think they want to do with that money? They, they're putting it in an account to get a return. And I've even had some of those folks um, basically get out of the investment that they were in and even pay a penalty because they were only getting, you know, 2%, whatever in, uh, in a CD or whatever it was they had. And they said, oh, get my money out of here. I want, I want the 8%, you know? And, um, and they're just eager to put that money to work and work with people they like and trust. So that is ultimately one of the gold mines um, that you can go to because that's specifically what they're wanting to do is invest that money that's sitting there. Dean, let's say you are at uh, a social event. Let's say you're at church. Let's say you're in some kind of setting with other people that you know, you got a relationship with, maybe you're meeting some new people or whatever. How do you start the conversation with someone else <clears throat> to that would possibly lead to attracting them to being a private lender to where you're not sounding like you're trying to sell somebody on something? Yeah. Now, the way that I typically do it, Jay, is the conversation just naturally comes up. Well, you know, what do you do for work or what do you do for business? Um, and so once we get into that kind of conversation, naturally I'll share what I'm doing. Um, Hey, I'm buying real estate. I will borrow someone else's money, give them a return on that. They're a passive investor. And so I'll borrow those other people's money, go buy properties and I'll fix and flip it or, you know, keep it as a rental and refinance it. And then they get their money back out and then we kind of rinse and repeat. So that's what I do. And then once we get into what they're doing, um, maybe I'll ask them, Hey, you know, have you done any type of investments? Have you bought any other properties? Have you gotten into the stock market? Have you done any type of investments at all? Um, and then once they talk about what those are, you might bring up, well, how have those gone for you? You know, how do you like, how's that, how that's going? Well, you know, I'm getting this kind of return and let's just assume it's lower than what we could give, you know, Hey, well, do you like that? Um, is there enough opportunities for you to keep that going? And if for chance there isn't, um, you might just subtly bring up, well, Hey, you know, I work with other people. I don't, I don't necessarily have an opportunity right now, but if you're interested in getting an X percent return, I might have some opportunities for you in the future. I don't know. Um, we might be able to kind of squeeze you in there. So it's just something that's a, a no pressure kind of situation, but the easiest way to do it is first to explain what you're doing and then to get into what they're doing, what other type of investments they've done, and then ask how those have gone for them. Because sometimes that can even be part of your, your leverage. If they're getting a 3% return, well, how does double that sound? How does a 6% return sound? <laughs> it probably sounds a lot better than three. So you might get uh, a great return for them and also a great return for yourself on borrowing that money. So um, it could be an ultimate win-win that just is, is a no-brainer. And that's the best way I like to get into those conversations. I love what you just uh, shared and explained. I love the phrase uh, in your conversation that you have when you say, I don't have an opportunity now. I don't know, maybe we, I might for you down the road. And so it's like, you're just talking about what you do and how you work with other people. I love your phrase on win, win, win. I talk about that all the time that, you know, uh, for the private lender, I mean, where else are they going to get these kind of high rates of returns safely and securely? And it just ends up being a beautiful win, win relationship for, you know, both sides of the table. And, you know, with that in mind, Dean, I tell you, I'm so excited. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking about exactly some points that are in my brand new private money guide that I just finished writing. Uh, in fact, it's called seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate business. And I tell you, friend, if you're looking for funding for your deals uh, and you make the rules and never miss out on a deal for not having the money, then um, go get this for free right now. It'll get you on the fast track to private money at jayconner.com, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash money guide. It will get you on the fast track to private money. You can download that for free at jayconner, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com 
forward slash money guide. Dean, I want to talk to you for a moment about your uh, career with the NFL and, and playing for the, um, playing for the team out there in California. What attributes, what disciplines, what personality traits of Dean Rogers lended yourself to being successful in the NFL that transfers over to being a successful real estate investor? Yeah, I love that question because I um, spent a lot more time thinking about it. You know, why why have I been able to make it? And uh, I think the bottom line, Jay, is any entrepreneur that makes it are going to have similar traits, personality traits to a professional athlete. And, and what that is, I boiled it down to just one thing, one thing, Jay, and that is not um, uh, necessarily their skills. Right, it's not their skills of them being the smartest or the brightest or the strongest or the fastest or whatever it is. What it boils down to is discipline. Is discipline. Think about athletes, right? For them to be able to perform at a high level, um, it requires an insane amount of discipline to be able to train day in and day out to eat the right nutrition to be able to have your body perform at the highest level possible to get the right amount of sleep and rest to perform at the highest level possible. And there's some positions that quite aren't as tested as, as uh, others, but in many positions, you, you might think a lot of these professional athletes are just, you know, a bunch of big bozos running around in running into each other, but the actual level of you know, skill and strategy and understanding of plays and all the different variations just in one scenario and having to be prepared for that is pretty intense. Um, and so I'd say that what it boils down to is the discipline to be willing, whether you feel good or not, whether you're having a good day or not, to show up and put in the work, right? And that means uh, in sports, if you got a boo-boo and you don't feel good, if you wake up feeling sick, are you going to go to your coach and just say, ah, I'm just not feeling too good today. Um, don't really feel like it, right? Um, uh, you know, I didn't get that good of sleep last night. Or, hey, my leg's just sore. You know, uh, I think I'm going to sit this one out. It doesn't fly. That doesn't work. And so the entrepreneurs <laughs> who are performing at the highest level, and for me, what's translated over is just regardless of how I feel, if I'm having a good day or not, I'm still putting in the work day in and day out. And for, for most people um, that are, again, at the professional level when it comes to sports, they're not the ones that are the first to leave practice. They're not the ones that are skipping out on the extra work. The people who get ahead are the ones that are in the, the uh, you know, putting in the extra time to review film right? Watching game film and studying and making sure that they're prepared mentally. Uh, they're in there working out extra time to get their muscles prepared and their body prepared. They're eating the right food. They're putting in that extra time. And so for me, Jay, going from the NFL and being at that level, I didn't get there because I was the biggest, I was the strongest, I was the fastest. It's because I consistently showed up and was a football player that put in uh, the work and effort, and then translated to game day and getting results and um, getting that opportunity to make it. So for me, I think that's the biggest thing that's translated here is it's not easy to be an entrepreneur, right? Uh, it takes someone who's willing to put in the extra time because how many people say they don't have enough time in the day, but they're cutting out from their job at five o'clock and they're getting home. They're going out to dinner. They're spending time with their friends. They're um, they're watching Netflix and hanging out in bed. And there's been four or five hours of the day that they could have used to get ahead in that dream that they've had, right? They want it, but they weren't willing to put in the action and the effort to get the results. So I think that's what sets people apart is discipline. If someone is a real estate investor, or is wanting to start in real estate investing and they just feel like they lack the discipline that it may take 
do you think a coach might help them? 100%. I mean, for someone who has some accountability and guidance is ultimately what most people need. Most people aren't as self-motivated and driven to just do it regardless. So kind of need to rely on someone else to give them that kick in the butt. And, and that's what I'm doing with my students is taking them through not only the, the training material that's there, but we have several weekly check-ins where we're jumping on the phone. We're going through, you know, negotiation training. We're going through Q and a, and we're also checking in on where their progress is and how they're doing. And I've found that that level of accountability is what most people need because people want it and they might even have the answers in front of them of how to do it. But ultimately to get off the couch, to, to be willing to put in that extra time, you need someone who's going to push and drive you. So for me growing up it was sports, you know, I had coaches, I had people who were training me and that level of accountability helped me. I had a speed coach. I had a strength coach. I had a speed and agility coach. Um, beyond just the actual head coach of the team and my own position coach, right? I had multiple coaches helping me throughout my journey to help make sure I had the right information of what I should be doing and how I should be training, but also to make sure to hold me accountable to show up and put in that work. Well, Dean, you've done uh, all different types of real estate investing. Um, you've got, you know, buy and hold, uh, rental portfolio, you've got flipping houses, you've got wholesaling. Uh, you've just recently put together uh, the wholesaling playbook uh, that shows a real estate investor, you know, step-by-step -step proven systems and, and all that. So when it, when it comes to, you got a deal, all right? Well, let's say it's a, you got a house, right? Because we wholesale houses. Typically we don't wholesale commercial projects. So typically we wholesale houses. First of all, What's your definition of wholesaling a house? What does that mean to wholesale a property? Yeah. Simply put, Jay, to wholesale a house is the transaction in which you have an investment property, you close that transaction, you make money without ever owning the property for one day. And the way that logistically works is you get a contract to purchase that property most of the time directly from the seller. And for what it's worth, you can even do this with on-market properties if you do it correctly. But my, my favorite way to do it is directly with the homeowner. I have a contract to purchase it. And then as part of my investment strategy, I decide that for me, the best uh, opportunity that's presented itself is to actually sell this property, to assign the rights to buy this property to someone else. And by doing so, just the paper, the one piece of paper that's signed saying, I'm going to assign this to someone else, they now have the rights to purchase that property for the same purchase price that I have it in all the terms. However, there's also an assignment fee associated. So they're agreeing to pay me X amount of dollars to take over this property and to buy it at that purchase price. So it's all the same to the seller, the same agreed upon price. And now the buyer, the end buyer, has agreed that they're going to buy it for the purchase price plus my associated fee. Of course, they've run all their numbers and determined that all of the all things considered, it's a good deal for them. And they bring their money to closing and sign all the closing documents just as the seller does. And that end buyer now takes title and owns that property. As the transaction closes, I get sent from title and escrow that assignment fee, I don't own it for a day. It's a transactional uh, deal for me. And I make that money and I move on to the next deal. So your end buyer that you're collecting the assignment fee from after you have a property under contract, is your end buyer in most cases, another real estate investor that's actually going to pay cash um, uh, for the property, and then they're going to take it and they're going to, you know, do whatever with it, renovate it, put it on the market and sell it. Yep. Yep. Most of the time they're fixing and flipping it or they're keeping it as a rental. And from time to time, they might even want it for their own personal residence, or they have a client that they know would want it as a personal residence or something for a family member, 
right? Some of these properties are outdated or, or not completely remodeled, but the seller was willing and able to sell it at a certain price that made sense. And so some of these properties are move in ready, financeable, and, uh, and it works out that way. But most of the time, most of the time, these houses are not only outdated, they're in some sort of distress and um, needing much repair. And, and that's where the opportunity for us comes in to, to buy that deal. What's your average assignment fee that you're collecting these days on a wholesale deal? Yeah, the average is- And, about, I, know, and I know it's going to vary, right? It's going to vary, yeah. The average is about $20,000. Um, that means some of them are 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, hundred thousand dollars, right? They've been as high as that. And then some of them, just the way the numbers work out, <coughs> you might make $5,000. You might make a couple thousand dollars, but generally speaking, based on us knowing what our goals are as a company, um, what makes sense for us to do a deal, we're negotiating based on us making at least around 20,000. And if it makes sense, if the, the proper needs extensive work, we'll negotiate a little bit more uh, to get a bigger spread in there. So you're a wholesaler. You're also a flipper yourself. You're looking at a deal. You're looking at the numbers. How do you decide, am I going to wholesale this deal and collect an assignment fee? Or am I going to stay in this deal and I'm going to you know, renovate it myself? and make a larger profit? What's the deciding factors? Yeah, I love this question. And ultimately, to help you determine for yourself how to make this decision is what's going on. What's going on with your business? What are your goals? What are you willing and able to do? And for us, as, as I've matured over you know my investing career, we used to do just only flips. I mean, we were doing 20 flips at a time. And for me, that was a lot of operational uh, effort and energy that the way that I have the business set up between me and my business partner and our team members, it just didn't make sense for us to do too many projects at a time. So where we're at now today in our business is we'll first focus on evaluating what will make sense here, right? And if it makes sense as a rental, because we want to continue growing our rental portfolio, and it can pencil out to where we can have minimal to zero dollars in that rental by the time that we've purchased it, remodeled it, and refinanced it. By the time we've done all that, if we can have little to no money in that deal out of our pocket, then we want to keep it as a rental. And naturally, we want it to cash flow as well. Okay. If we can accomplish that, that's the very first decision we make. Can this work as a rental with that in mind? Now, granted, there's many other opportunities where we could buy a rental, good property, well set up for a rental that would cash flow, that would involve some more of our money down, needing to be stuck in that deal, 10, 20% down, whatever it is. But our focus is to keep as little amount of money in that deal as possible. So, first, we look at it from a rental. Next, we look at, is this an easy in and out flip where it's going to be low stress, low amount of effort for us to do it? And could we maximize the return? Or is this a more involved flip that maybe is going to require more of our time and effort and resources to get the deal done that doesn't justify the, the additional return we would get if we flipped it, right? Because every deal we're doing we're an experienced investor. We know what other investors expect to make at a bare minimum when they're buying a property. So we bake that into our numbers when we when we determine what we could wholesale it for. So if the bang for buck isn't worth it for the fix and flip, then we'll ultimately determine to wholesale it. So that's kind of the progression we go through. We go through rental, then we go through fix and flip and also determine do we have bandwidth for it? Because we only want to do a couple flips at a time at this point um, to make sure we're not overwhelming ourselves and overextending uh, the time and effort to do that. So that's kind of the progression we'll go through, Jay, to ultimately determine which investment strategy we'll use. I hear people saying it all the time in this market. I can't find any deals. I can't find any deals. There's nothing in the multiple listing service. Well, 
of course, there's nothing in the multiple listing service. It's called, you know, supply and demand. So in this market, what is your favorite way or ways to find uh, motivated sellers off market from directly from for sale by owners? Yeah, man, I tell you what, we, we do all sorts of marketing and it's no guarantee which marketing strategy is going to work every month. Um, which is part of the reason why we do so many different types of marketing strategies. The ones that we, we do currently now <clears throat> are going to be cold calling, direct mail, um, pay-per-click, so Google ads. They call that PPC. Uh, we do Facebook marketing, and then we also do TV ads. So we do multiple different marketing strategies that bring in um, – deals. And each one of those works for us. Each and every single one of those works. Um, but when it comes to my favorite, one of the ones I didn't mention is actually deals that we're doing with other investors. Okay. Now I just told you that we buy rentals, we do fix and flips and we wholesale. How are we doing deals with other people? Well, the way we're doing deals with other people is we've We've intentionally put the effort and energy out there to add value and help other investors through their investing journey, whether it's just helping them understand how to put a deal together and what numbers would make sense, or we're actually physically going on an appointment to go meet the seller, take pictures, negotiate the contract, get it under contract, and then wholesale it to an end buyer um, and handle that whole transaction. Anywhere in between, we've been doing that intentionally. And as a result, it's the 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 abundance mindset, the the law of attraction has brought deals to us from other investors wanting us to help them on their deals. And what's that what that's done for us, Jay, is added just last year alone seven figures to our business from I'll call it free deals, other people bringing us deals, right? And for us, with our experience. We've been able to negotiate these deals at the best prices. We've been able to wholesale and sell them to end buyers, cash buyers at the best prices and really optimize that opportunity for that other investor and ourselves. And we split the profit 50-50. So what that's turned into is just a lot more deals that we are doing, working with other people and a great source of revenue that is is so much fun. I mean, it's so much, it's so rewarding to do a deal with someone else to be able to help them achieve an amazing goal and make help them make twenty thousand dollars, thirty, forty thousand dollars. That's their cut, their half of the cut that they otherwise maybe wouldn't have been able to put the deal together just from lack of experience or last lack of resources. And so it's just a super win-win for everybody. And one of the most exciting areas for our business that we've seen a lot of growth. That's awesome, Dean. You have shared such valuable, valuable information here on the show. How can a real estate investor connect with you? Yeah, I would just love if people connect with me because I love talking about real estate and just super passionate about it. So you guys can reach out to me. If you go to deanrogers.com and, and click on contact at the top, You'll see all my social media stuff. Just to highlight a few, you could go to Instagram, Dean Rogers Real Estate, or you go to youtube.com forward slash Dean Rogers. Um, and you know, I've got content on there as well as just a place to uh, connect and stay in contact with me. So please reach out. I love to interact with other people and constantly be talking about real estate because the more people, you've probably heard it a million times, your network is your net worth. And I've experience it firsthand. The more people I meet, the more doors open, the more opportunities, the more money that I'm making just from being around other good people. So please reach out, stay connected with me and would we'll love to uh, help you guys through your journey. Go to deanrogers.com. That's www.dean, D-E-A-N, Rogers, R-O-G-E-R-S, deanrogers.com. And um, I tell you what, if you're remotely interested in the uh, the wholesaling playbook, he can plug you into that. Dean, I'm looking forward to seeing you at our upcoming Mastermind. Can't wait to uh, to network with you there as well. And again, thank you for coming on. 
Thanks. It's been a blast. Always a pleasure to be with you, Jay. We'll catch you soon. All right. You got it, man. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. And I'm looking forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconnor.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.